Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, we are so excited to have you with us for this webinar. It looks like we have already over 100 people uh, with us, so um, we appreciate you joining us. If you have questions, please uh, go ahead and drop those in the chat box. We'll answer some of them throughout the program and some others near the end. Um, so first I wanted to say thank you to everyone who's been participating with us during this week of action. Um, we kicked things off on Sunday afternoon with a very large virtual event uh, where folks had a chance to talk with one another in small groups and um, we are in breakout rooms and we're still sifting through some really good ideas that came from that event so thank you to everyone who uh, participated on monday uh, we had hundreds more new people uh, know what ranked choice voting is uh, after watching an rcv explainer video uh, so we appreciate many of you sharing that out and yesterday we had many more uh, vote uh, in some rank it dot vote polls demonstrating how easy it is for uh, people to vote in rank choice voting elections. So um, nice work on all of that from um, many of you so far. And tonight we are uh, really excited um, to share a little bit about what we know um, about how we could see rank choice voting used in presidential elections. Five states already used it this cycle in primary elections, and the state of Maine will use it in the general election this year. And if we want every voter to have a chance to rank their preferences for president, we have some work to do. Tonight is the start to that. Plus, we are just halfway through the week of action, so stay tuned to our social media accounts and your email inbox for information about how to participate in the actions tomorrow, Friday, and Saturday. This week of action is all about spreading the word and building interest in ranked choice voting, and we need your help to do that. Uh, so with that, I think we'll get started. Um, again, as a reminder, if you have questions, please um, add those in the chat box and we will uh, answer some as we go and, and others near the, near the end. Uh, so the presenters tonight are myself, along with uh, Katie Dahl, Outreach Manager at Fair Vote, along with Scott Siebel and Deb Otis. Uh, Scott is Director of Outreach at Fair Vote. Scott has over a decade of experience working on local, state, and national campaigns. Deb is Senior Research Analyst at Fair Vote and a founding member of Voter Choice Massachusetts, the campaign to win RCV statewide in Massachusetts. So I'll start this evening with a brief note about the election landscape. After that, I'll quickly review the basics of ranked choice voting for any newcomers we have tonight. Then Scott will get into where we are right now in the ranked choice voting world, including the use of RCV in five state primaries and some of those results. And next we'll hear from Deb. Uh, she'll dig into details about what laws need to change to see RCV in the presidential election. Uh, so elections are a tough subject, even um, under normal circumstances. And now this year we have the added layer of pandemic complexity. There has been no consistency in how each state is responding to the public health crisis. Some are maintaining in-person voting or hastily drafting vote by mail options. Some states delayed primary elections while others moved forward as planned. Each state uh, is starting from a different place uh, as they think about improving access for voters during a pandemic. So access to vote by mail and early voting, online voter registration or automatic voter registration and ranked choice voting are all ways to help reduce risk while also seeing, uh, still seeing voters cast their ballots. But wishing doesn't make it so, as we all know, budget constraints, relevant election expertise, political dynamics, a short timeline, uh, among others, are all reasons, and some of them very good reasons, that will see variation in how states respond. We can say that RCV in combination with vote by mail made an enormous difference in, in four state primaries during the, this pandemic. While other states were delaying elections or risking public health by allowing them to go forward, Wyoming, 
Alaska, Hawaii, and Kansas could move ahead with their ranked choice mail ballots. Voters cast their ballots from the safety of their homes and were able to express their true preferences without worrying about wasted votes. The people of Maine and then the state legislature there blazed as a trail for seeing ranked choice voting used in the presidential election. Very exciting. And now state parties in three more states, Utah, Indiana, and Minnesota, are using RCV at their conventions. More good news. Um, another variable added to the mix now is we have a third candidate in the general election. Uh, analysis about the potential impact of Representative Justin Amash entering the race is already gearing up with the term spoiler seeing, seen in headlines, as many of you I'm sure have seen. Sadly, when an election features more than two candidates, our voting rules break down. Uh, some of us are forced to choose between a candidate we want most and the candidate we believe has the best chance to win. It really does not have to be that way. We'll talk about more, more about that tonight. I'd like to take just a couple minutes to demonstrate how ranked choice voting works as a refresher and for any new folks we have tonight. With ranked choice voting, voters get to rank candidates in order of preference. If a candidate receives more than half of the first choices, they win, just like any other election. If not, the candidate with the fewest votes is eliminated, and voters who picked that candidate as number one will have their votes count for their next choice. This process continues until a candidate wins with more than half the votes. This gets us to a winner with majority support from the electorate uh, in other words, most voters like a candidate. Here, we don't know for sure what most voters want. Uh, these are the results of the 2016 general presidential election in Michigan. None of the candidates earned a majority. 12 states had no majority winner in 2016. One of the most exciting RCV benefits is that it can accommodate crowded primary fields. So this cycle, the Democrats saw an historic number of candidates, and the Republicans had a pretty large number for the presidency in 2016. And when a lot of people throw their hat in the ring to run for office, it's a sign that our democracy is working. There is a robust conversation about issues that may not be heard when just a couple of people are running, and that is a good thing. New ideas and ideas whose time have come um, have a way of entering our public discourse when they're all jostling for attention, those candidates. Uh, and yet, concerns over vote splitting loom. So if, for example, three candidates are relatively similar in their views and therefore generally attractive to like-minded voters, those voters will splinter as they choose their favorite. And that can result in a fourth candidate, for example, winning when in fact most people wanted someone else. So if, you know, if our elections are so fragile that a strong candidate showing can throw the entire system into disarray, the problem isn't with those candidates deciding to run, it's with our elections. Ranked choice voting removes this concern. Uh, the candidate with the broadest support will win no matter how many are on the ballot. Another benefit of RCV is no more wasted votes. Wasted votes can have two meanings in this context. Rank choice voting allows third party voters to sincerely rank their preferred candidate first without feeling like their votes are wasted on someone who is unlikely to win. And if voters have cast their ballot early for a candidate who then drops out of the race before ballots are counted, those votes are wasted. So in both cases, ranked choice voting can make uh, wasted votes a thing of the past. I spoke earlier about Representative uh, Amash in the general election, everyone should be able to vote for the candidate they want uh, without fear of spoiling an election or splitting the vote. Ranked choice voting makes that simple for voters, no more spoilers uh, in the general election. RCV also incentivizes issue-focused campaigns. With ranked choice voting, candidates campaign beyond their base and run a more positive collaborative campaign. They're incentivized to win votes from a broader range of voters than they normally would. So not just speaking to their base. Um, so there is a path forward and we're already on it. Uh, Scott will talk next about where RCV is happening uh, already today. 
Thanks, Katie. Um, so um, I appreciate all of you guys uh, putting your questions in the chat. We'll get to some of those questions a little bit. Uh, we'll have uh, about 20 minutes at the end, but um, for now, thank Katie. Um, I want to talk about where ranked choice voting is used uh, right now. So as you can see there, um, it's used all across the country uh, from uh, the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco, Berkeley, Oakland, uh, over to St. Paul and Minneapolis, uh, to uh, the state of Maine and uh, city of Cambridge and uh, the city of Tacoma Park, Maryland, where Fair Vote uh, is uh, based out of. Um, so we've seen a lot of growth in the last um, uh, couple years um, of in, on lo local municipalities uh, supporting ranked voting. Just in the last uh, year, uh, cities of, of Payson and Utah, or Payson and Vineyard out in Utah, um, uh, just started using ranked choice voting. Uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico, Santa Fe, New Mexico, just started using it uh, recently. So we're really seeing an uptick in, in, in more voters using ranked choice voting all across the country. And we'll be seeing that again uh, next year as um, New York City uh, this past year uh, voted to use ranked choice voting for their uh, city elections. So we'll be up to um, you know, over 10 million voters uh, uh, of voting age population will be able to use ranked cho choice voting either now or in the next election. Um, so we're really excited about that. Uh, and potentially there are some other uh, exciting opportunities to expand ranked choice voting right now. Um, uh, in Massachusetts right now, there's a, a, a ballot initiative happened to that state. Um, and in uh, Alaska, the, there's a ballot initiative happening right now up in Alaska uh, that would allow a top four uh, ranked choice voting election uh, to the uh, general. Also, it would um, uh, include uh, some campaign finance laws as well. So it's a really interesting uh, uh, ballot initiative up there happening in Alaska. So we're ex really excited about um, uh, rank where ranked choice voting is at. Um, and not only all those things, but as Katie talked about, uh, five states have now used ranked choice voting uh, for the presidential primary. Um, so as um, Katie said, Nevada, Alaska, Hawaii, Kansas, and Wyoming have used uh, ranked choice voting this year uh, for their uh, Democratic presidential primary. So Nevada used it for their early voters. Um, there were uh, almost 75,000 uh, early voters uh, in Nevada that, that used a ranked ballot. And uh, we don't have all the data uh, for that because they put it into their, to their caucuses. So they used all of that early vote ranked choice data and, and rolled that into their caucus system. Uh, like I said, 75,000 uh, voters in Nevada used a ranked choice voting, voting ballot, while 30,000 voters actually participated at the caucus site. So uh, at this year's Nevada Democratic Caucus, uh, you know, well more, uh, well more, uh, more people used uh, the ranked ballot than, than actually did the caucuses. Um, and Alaska, Hawaii, Kansas, and Wyoming used uh, ranked choice voting uh, plus vote by mail. So as you guys know, um, you know, we're all at home right now and uh, ranked choice voting was uh, used uh, uh, with vote by mail uh, to, you know, help, um, uh, you know, in, in the process of eliminating our in-person voting in Alaska, Wyoming, and, and, and Kansas. Um, and that was totally fine because they had vote by mail and ranked choice voting. So why use uh, ranked choice voting for a primary? Well, it uh, it's better for the party, it's better for the candidates, and better it's better for the voters. So it's better for everyone involved. Um, and so this year we really reached out to the to the the Democratic parties in these four states or these five states, and and asked them. You know, they really wanted to get uh, more involvement in their. Uh, Democratic Party pres presidential elections. All of these states were using caucuses in 2016 and previously, 
And for a caucus, you need to bring people in and, and, and you know, have them all come to one place. Uh, but in a primary, you can just vote, you can early vote, you can vote by mail. Um, so uh, it really is a, it broadens the coalition, it strengthens the party, uh, and you're, you're, you're hopefully going to get to a unifying candidate. Um, as we saw this year uh, in the Democratic presidential primary, we had uh, 15, no, 20 or 30 or 120 or so uh, Democratic uh, candidates at one point. Um, there were a lot, and so there was a lot of different uh, ideological, there's a lot of different uh, backgrounds, a lot of different ideological wings of the party. So some say the Bernie and Warren wing, or some say the, the more you know centrist Biden, uh, Pete or Amy uh, Klobuchar kind of wing. Um, with with our with our elections right now, how uh, candidates were fo forced to choose uh, one or the other, and had to think about voting strategically. With ranked choice voting, uh, it's better for the party; more voices voices can be in there, and the uh, ranked choice voting election can just um, uh, figure all that out by itself and they can coalesce around a candidate. And it's better for candidates so they don't have to worry about splitting the vote. So they can, uh, it, it unifies uh, the, their, their candidacy and it has a coalition strategy rather than the scorch earth uh, kind of campaign. Uh, we've seen in previous elections, whether it's uh, Portland, Maine, uh, Las Cruces and Santa Fe, New Mexico, we've actually seen um, press uh, coming out that says, uh, wow, this, this election with ranked choice voting is so positive, it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, and it's so positive because the candidates wanted to reach out uh, to their second and third choices uh, to, to, to make sure they, they built that coalition to win. And imagine uh, this, this presidential party uh, election with the Democrats, if uh, Bernie supporters were reaching out to Warren supporters, if Warren supporters were reaching out to Bernie supporters, if Biden supporters were reaching out to both of those candidates and other candidates, uh, whoever the ended up would ended up uh, would be the nominee would have already reached out to beyond their base, um, and so that's what ranked choice voting does, and that's what ranked choice voting rewards. So it's 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 better for the voters; it gives people more choice, but it also is better for for the parties uh, and better for the candidates as we go forward. So. Uh, I would also, uh, so I want to talk about uh, the 2020 presidential primaries we've seen so far. So, uh, like I said, five states used it. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, data necessarily from Nevada, like I said, because they uh, rolled all of that into the caucus system. Uh, and Hawaii's data will come out uh, later this month. So what we have is data from uh, Alaska, Wyoming, and Kansas right now. So what we've seen is it's increased voter turnout and have a reduction in wasted votes and the voters really understand how to rank their ballots. Um, so as we, you can see there, um, it did increase voter turnout from the 2016 caucus hugely. Um, so in Alaska, it, uh, in Alaska, it almost doubled uh, the voter turnout from 2016. In Wyoming, it almost, it over, it, it more than doubled uh, the uh, 2016 uh, caucus numbers there. In Kansas, whoa, look at that. In Kansas, it over, it tripled, it's more than tripled voter turnout in Kansas uh, this year uh, than they were in, in the 2016 uh, election. Um, also, uh, like I said, we don't have any wasted votes anymore uh, with the uh, uh, ranked choice voting. So uh, more than eight out of the 10 uh, of those first choice votes went on to count for a backup choice in the final round. So as you can see there, um, in each state where we have data, like over 10% of the ballots uh, would have been potentially what we call wasted on votes for candid candidates who are not available, who are not viable without ranked choice voting. Uh, but thanks to ranked choice voting, these voters were able to have their next choice counted. Um, so there's a lot of uh, people, uh, even though Alaska, Wyoming, and Kansas were later on in the calendar, 
there are quite a few people, as you see, over you know ten percent in each of them, who voted for Klobuchar, who voted for Tulsi, or who voted for uh, a candidate who who had dropped out or or, or wasn't viable anymore, and those uh, votes were able to go to their second choices. Um, so if somebody really, really, really wanted to vote for Mayor Pete in Kansas, they could definitely vote for Mayor Pete, uh, and uh, their vote went to their backup choice as well. So it really um, encourages more vote, more candidates to stay involved, more voices to be heard, and it, it allows um, you know no votes to be wasted. So as you can see, voters understood how to rank their candidates. So in all three of these states, they had uh, five uh, up to five rankings. Um, they could rank uh, you could rank one, you could rank two, three, four, five. Uh, and and they uh, they did that basically so um, it, it would be easier to count them. But by the time Alaska, Wyoming, uh, Kansas came along, came around, there were uh, very few um, candidates actually still in the race. But as you can see there, uh, almost two um, about seventy five percent of voters in those three states decided to rank multiple candidates. So uh, that means uh, most of the voters in those states uh, uh, saw their ballot and didn't just vote for Biden and then going home, or didn't just vote for Bernie and going home, or didn't just vote for, for Warren and then, and then that's it. Uh, they had a choice, they had a second choice, they had a third choice, they had a fourth choice and a fifth choice. And um, over 99.8% uh, uh, of those uh, ballots that had valid first choices were, were, were valid um, and uh, that had first choices ended up being valid. By that, I mean, there were very few errors. Um, and, and some of the things that we uh, heard about that some of the pushback that we get uh, a lot from people who um, think about, you know, should we have ranked choice voting is it's too confusing. Will voters understand it? Well, obviously voters understand it. Uh, voters can rank their ballots uh, easily, so um, uh, uh, so we can move past that. Is it too confusing? Uh, question. So let's get to the results. Um, so from Kansas, uh, we can see uh, the round by round. It went four rounds uh, in Kansas. Uh, as you can see there, uh, the first round, um, Biden easily has uh, seventy percent. Uh, Bernie with 18, uh, Warren with almost 8%. Uh, uncommitted was a was a, a potential person uh, you could vote for. Um, uh, Tulsi got uh, 1%. Um, so in, an, in a single winner ranked choice voting election, uh, we would say, okay, that's over 50% for Joe Biden. But in this case, what the Democratic Party does is allocates, allocates delegates to anyone uh, over a 15 percent threshold, uh, they will allocate delegates uh, to those voters. So from the first round, um, uh, Biden gets uh, over that 15 percent threshold, Bernie gets over that 15 percent threshold, but the other candidates do not. So that's how we go to round two, where Tulsi gets eliminated, uh, and then round three, where uncommitted gets uh, uh, eliminated, and then potentially, and then finally to round four, um, Elizabeth Warren uh, in round three has 8.7%. She doesn't hit that 15% threshold. Uh, so her uh, votes gets allocated uh, out to the rest of them. And that's how we get uh, round four with Joe Biden finally um, at the end of the round getting 76.9% to Bernie's 23.1%. And then um, Kansas will uh, allocate their delegates a, a proportionally from that number. Um, so that's just how the Democrats do it. Uh, they have uh, the, the rules within the Democratic Party uh, that uh, they have a 15% threshold. Other parties don't have necessarily have that, um, that rule. Uh, uh, in, on the Republican side, they have kind of a winner take all um, uh, kind of thing. They don't, they don't have the 15% uh, threshold. Um, so from 2016, as you may have seen, the uh, elections uh, in, in the Republican primary, uh, Donald Trump uh, won quite a few states early on with less than 50% of the vote. 
but he got 100% of the, of the, uh, the delegates from those states. Um, so with, with, with ranked choice voting, um, it would uh, uh, make sure in whatever kind of formula that the Democrats or the Republicans or any other party decides, um, it would uh, allocate those delegates uh, more fairly. So lastly, I want to talk a, a little bit about um, RCV for the presidential uh, general election, or yeah, for the presidential general election. Uh, as you can see there, um, I'm not sure if you, you, you've noticed, but what do all those people have in common? Uh, they are third notable third party presidential candidates in the recent past, um, um, whether it's uh, Ross Perot in 92, Nader in 2000, Jill Stein and Gary Johnson in 16, and potentially uh, this year, Justin Amash uh, running on the Libertarian Party. Um, so this happens every single year um, that, you know, uh, that obviously third parties will run. Uh, that's fantastic that we, 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 we invite more, uh, more, more choice uh, in, in our elections. Um, but what happens when um, we have more than one choice and we don't get majority support, uh, which happened uh, with Ross Perot's election in 92. Uh, Perot got 20%, uh, almost 20% of the vote. Famously, Ralph Nader uh, picked off enough uh, percentage points in Florida uh, that could have tipped the election either way. Um, and, and Jill Stein and, and Gary Johnson each got, uh, Jill Stein got about 1% and, and Gary Johnson got about 2% of the general election uh, uh, votes in 2016. Um, so with close elections between the Democrats and Republicans um, in, in different states and, and across the country, uh, third party candidates uh, could, could tip the balance and you, we could end up electing uh, candidates that don't have majority support. So um, what's, the, what's, the, what's the solution to that? Um, should we banish third parties from the ballot? Well, like, like I said, I don't, think that's, I don't think that's the best solution. Should we continue to elect the most powerful leader in the world without the supporting major, uh, majority of those voters? Um, you know, uh, ranked choice voting in the presidential general election would just make a ton of sense here. Um, and, you know, it, to talk a little bit about how it would make sense and, and, and kind of how we get there um, to, uh, you know, uh, pass ranked choice voting in the general election or in the primary election. Uh, Deb's going to talk, get, get into a little bit more detail about uh, how that might happen legally uh, and uh, through what means. So, uh, Deb. Thank you, Scott. Uh, it's really powerful to hear the stories, Scott, about the success in those states that used RCV in the primary this year. So yes, we are going to talk now about how we can expand that, how we can bring that to more states in the future. So when we are talking about RCV for president, for presidential elections, really we're talking about two different things, primaries and general elections, which are totally different beasts when it comes to the, our presidential election processes. So I'm going to talk about these two separately. Uh, let's start with primaries because uh, Scott and Katie already primed us with some info on how some primaries have been working. So I saw a question in the chat actually, and this will st start to address that. Someone asked, uh, what are the differences and what are the challenges with states that use party run primaries and state run primaries? So uh, the four states that implemented RCV already this year um, are using party run primaries. So for example, in Alaska, when the Democratic Party chose to start using ranked choice voting, the state of Alaska was not the decision maker there. It was the Democratic Party. And that's how it happened that the Democratic Party used ranked choice voting and the Republican Party did not this year. So the benefit of working with party run primary states is that when we as RCV activists want to bring ranked choice voting to our state, if it's a party run primary, then it's, it's a smaller group of people that you're trying to influence. You want, to, you want your statewide activist group to be working with like the party chair people. You don't need to sway an entire legislature. Um, a challenge with party run primary states is that 
if you're successful, you're going to have to go do it again to get other parties involved. So the, the work that was done in these initial four states, getting the Democratic Party on board is great. And they're only part of the way there because we still want buy-in from the Republican Party for their own uh, party-run primaries as well. And so these states with party-run primaries are in the minority. Most states have state-run primaries. Um, there are some, you know, some drawbacks of party-run primaries, like it could be more expensive and it can, it can open folks up to uh, difficulties with election administration, like when there were some issues, uh, some irregularities in the Iowa caucuses this year. So let's talk about the state-run primary states now. Uh, what does state-run primaries mean? It means that the primaries are conducted according to state law rather than simply the party regulations. So there would be an elections section within your state law, which governs things like when the primaries can be held, how candidates qualify for the ballot, et cetera. And so that's the section of law that would need to be changed uh, to make way for RCV. Um, Maine is the only state so far with a state-run primary to uh, pass ranked choice voting. Um, their legislature passed it in 2019, implementing ranked choice voting for presidential primaries and generals, but for the primaries, it doesn't go into effect until next cycle, till 2024. And so when it goes into effect, uh, it affects all of the parties that have state-run primaries. So it will impact uh, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party in Maine. And so the benefit of working with state-run primary states, remember that's the majority of states, uh, the benefit is that one ranked choice voting law impacts both parties. So that's the, it, there's a simple path there. Um, the downside is that sometimes making changes at the state level uh, can be more difficult than working with just an individual party. Uh, so that, that's an overview of the different ways that uh, states conduct their primaries and how we would need to go about uh, changing it for those different states. So let's jump into the general election. Now, the key factor when we talk about presidential general elections is that it's always going to interact with the electoral college. Now remember, Americans don't vote directly for president. We vote for which electors that our states will send to the electoral college. Uh, the nice thing about this is that states have complete power to choose how to allocate their electors. So here are a few ways that some states currently allocate their electors. Um, a big one, the most states just do winner take all based on the statewide popular vote. Uh, now, since all of you folks are spending your Wednesday evening on a uh, ranked choice voting webinar, I think you probably already know the problems with, with a system like this. Um, as Katie mentioned earlier in this presentation, she looked at the 2016 presidential election um, and there were a dozen states where there was not a majority winner uh, for their presidential election in 2016. And so those states awarded 100% of their electors to a candidate who did not even get half of the vote in that state. So that's an issue. Um, another method that some states are currently using is uh, electors by congressional district. Nebraska does this and Maine did it uh, prior to uh, passing this RCV law. And so as you can imagine, there are some issues with this method as well. Um, it's susceptible to gerrymandering since it uses congressional districts and it may get rid of the idea of a swing state, but there are still swing districts. And so the congressional district solution does not uh, quite solve all of our issues. Um, and then the last method that's currently in use uh, is winner take all using ranked choice voting. So this is what Maine passed. It's the 2019 law that their state legislature passed. Um, they're, I, I mentioned they're doing it for primaries starting in 2024, RCV for presidential primaries, but they're also doing it for general and it starts this year in 2020. And so how did it happen? In Maine, it was a legislative path. Um, some of you may have heard about Maine's ballot campaign uh, when they first passed ranked choice voting in 2016. They did it by um, a ballot question, but then a couple years after that, the state legislature stepped in and expanded it. So the ballot question did not include president. When they included president, that was through the state legislature. And so paths for changing the way that your state awards electoral votes. First is the legislative path, what we just talked about. That's what Maine did, and it's possible in any other state. In a lot of ways, this is the simple path. 
your state legislators know the ins and outs of state laws, uh, and they can get this done quickly if they have the will to act. Um, one obstacle to consider is that you might need to have a veto-proof majority in your state legislature if you have an anti-RCV governor, so something to consider. Um, a good place to start, if you want to look into this state legislative path, is to uh, find out whether your state already has some ranked choice voting legislation. Um, on Fair Vote's website, we do have a tracker of state-by-state state, uh, ranked choice voting legislation, so you can find out what's already going on with your state. Um, and you should get connected, if you're not already, with your uh, state-level ranked choice voting advocacy group. Um, they will be able to point you towards the best actions you can take, regardless of whether legislation has already been introduced or not. This might be something like contacting your legislators. Uh, you can find info on your state level advocacy group if you're not yet connected to them uh, through Fair Vote's website. We do have a list of all of our um, state level partners and we definitely encourage you all to connect with your local folks there. And so that's the legislative path. Um, another path to consider is the ballot initiative if your state allows ballot questions. Um, as we said, in Maine, when they first passed RCV, it was by ballot question. Um, and that was a few years before this legislative action that expanded it to president. Uh, and so the ballot path is a good one to consider if your state legislature is slow to move on election reform issues. Uh, you could consider whether your legislature is friendly to other election reform things like same day uh, registration or automatic voter registration. If your legislature has shown interest in issues like that, they might also be friendly to something like ranked choice voting. Um, and so you could consider the legislative path. But if not, then it may be a challenge to get your state senator or representative to give ranked choice voting a fair shot. So in that case, the ballot initiative might be a good way to go. It can be expensive to run a statewide campaign. It takes a hefty voter education plan in order to win ranked choice voting. Uh, but do keep an eye on a couple of states uh, this November. Scott already mentioned Alaska and Massachusetts are both working on um, ballot measures for ranked choice voting. So definitely keep an eye on those two states. And there's you know, a third option, which I didn't list up here, and this is a amendment to your state constitution. A constitutional amendment can do just about anything, so it can definitely implement ranked choice voting. Um, but in general, a constitutional amendment requires some buy-in from your legislature. And if you already have a friendly legislature, then you might just be on path one, the legislative path. So I didn't, I didn't mention the uh, constitutional process here. So to wrap it up, these are the methods that your state could take to uh, implement ranked choice for the general presidential election. Um, next up, I do want to talk about a hypothetical. Uh, we began this general election conversation by framing it within the context of the Electoral College because it, that's the law of the land. But a common question we get asked is, what if we elected the president based on popular vote instead of the Electoral College? So this is all hypothetical, of course, but we hear our supporters thinking about this question and we get asked this question. So we did want to address it quickly. How would ranked choice voting fit in to a post-Electoral College world? Well, it partly depends on how we got there. Uh, there are a couple of methods people talk about when we, when we think of moving to a popular vote for president. Um, if states ratified a constitutional amendment to abolish the Electoral College. Um, at this point, there has not been concerted statewide action on that front, but it would be a st straightforward path to do it. Um, if America took that route, we can get our CV by uh, these couple of methods. An uh, easy way would be to include it through that same constitutional process, um, abolish the Electoral College, and determine the winner based on ranked choice popular vote. Um, another option is that Congress could simply pass a law doing that. Um, but the real question that we hear people asking when folks talk about uh, moving to a popular vote, they're asking us about the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And I just saw someone asking about this in the chat as well. So the Interstate Compact is an agreement between states that all of the participating states will award their electors to whoever wins the National Popular Vote. Uh, currently, it's been adopted by 15 states, I believe, uh, but it doesn't go into effect until enough states sign on that they can influence the winner. So 
if it succeeded and went into effect, that would mean that all the that individual states would give their electors to the winner of the national popular vote rather than the winner of their own state. And so how would ranked choice voting fit into something like that? Um, first of all, a key component, if we're going to use ranked choice voting among multiple states for the same contest, uh, they need to conform to a set of guidelines um, in order to, to match. Uh, for example, an important component would be that all states should list the same candidates on the ballot in order for these results to be combined into one ranked choice tally. So you would need something like uh, uh, an agreement for ballot access laws. So the states have to, have to agree on a framework uh, in order to use ranked choice voting together in a popular vote. So in order to do that, one method would be for Congress, if the compact went into effect, for Congress to simply pass a law that compact states will conduct their elections according to a certain set of rules, including RCV. Um, another option would be a compact within a compact sort of solution, where compact states agreed to it and set those guidelines and moved forward on their own with it um, once enough states were interested. So those are the paths for that, that hypothetical because we know that people have these questions. Uh, the bottom line is regardless of what other methods we use to elect the president, be it popular vote, electoral college, uh, at fair vote, of course, we feel strongly that RCV is an improvement on either of these methods, that this empowers voters and gives us more voice and more choice in the process. So that is the end of my update here on how we can expand RCV today. Uh, so next, we would like to take some audience questions. We have seen a lot of questions coming in. We're looking forward to answering some of these. Please keep them coming. Uh, I'm going to turn the microphone back over to Katie, who will uh, start taking some of these questions for us. Awesome. Thank you, Deb. Uh, and Scott's jumping back on too to join us to go um, through some of these questions. Thank you. So many questions coming in and also helpful answers. Uh, from our CV advocates who are on the call tonight. So thanks for, for jumping in and answering um, some of those uh, already before we even have um, a chance to. So um, I think the first question uh, I'll uh, pop over to Scott. Um, it is about um, the, the primary. So um, it's, it, someone is asking about ballot instructions in those four primary states and whether or not those, the successes in those states had anything to do with you know, how well we were instructing voters to, to vote. Um, you know, did, do you think that had a big difference? Is there um, you know, a, a really good sample in any of those four states that we can point to? Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll throw up a couple links on the chat uh, that you guys can take a look at. Uh, but you're right that Bell Design does have a, a, a influence on how well people rank. Uh, what we've seen from the Center for Civic Design that a grid ballot uh, uh, is, is probably the best ballot uh, for people to use, and that's the ballot that, these four, that at least three of the four states used. So the ballots in Alaska, Wyoming, and Kansas look pretty much exactly uh, the same. And uh, the, the ballots in, in Hawaii look a little bit different. Uh, Hawaii's um, election will be, uh, results will come out later this month, but they could do up to up to three, not up to five. Um, and um, so I'll, I'll throw a couple things in the chat box here that you guys can take a look at, but the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center is a good place to look, uh, rankedchoicevoting.org. Um, if you look at, uh, I just put up a rankedchoicevoting.org ballot layout. Uh, there's a lot of different sample ballots on there. Um, that you guys can take a look at. Um, and um, uh, one of the things, and it's just generally, I, I saw a couple questions about this as it relates to the, to the presidential primary states. We also, Fair Vote was instrumental in doing um, some voter education in that, in these states. So um, uh, just a, a quick uh, one, one minute overview of what we did there. So with, um, with Hawaii and, and Kansas and, and Wyoming and, and Alaska, we helped um, you know do some grass tops trainings, uh, on the ground trainings when going on the ground actually was available to us, um, and uh, trained up uh, a lot of people uh, to be able to uh, 
you know, talk about ranked choice voting and talk about how it's going to be working. We also did uh, helped uh, run some uh, some social media ads. We helped uh, uh, partner with on the ground organizations to uh, that were already there, like Rank the Vote Kansas or Wichita State University in Kansas or uh, uh, Equality uh, Wyoming uh, and, 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 and quite a few other groups throughout uh, those states uh, that then um, we did a little train the trainers kinds of things to allow them to um, talk to their uh, constituencies. So uh, we did quite a few uh, things to be able to, to get the word out, um, but even places that we might not have been able to get the word out, as you saw uh, earlier, uh, people uh, understand how to rank their ballots. So uh, uh, it's, it's, it's important to have a good uh, uh, layout uh, on the ballot, but it's also important to do a, a good voter education campaign. Cool, thank you. Um, uh, next, um, we had a question that's uh, about uh, local uh, local elections using um, RCV and local elections. The question is whether a, a, a community, a local community could use RCV if the state isn't or if the state is opposed. Uh, and the answer to that, um, some of you um, I think wrote in the chat as well, is it depends on the state. Um, some states have laws that um, allow uh, local jurisdictions, um, municipal jurisdictions to have more freedom in how they run elections, including using ranked choice voting, others do not. And so you'd need um, a state law um, change to, to see RCV at the local level in those states. So um, we, we certainly, if you, you wanna reach out directly to us after um, with a question about your specific state, we can uh, help you with that. Um, Next uh, question um, I would throw out to either Scott or Deb that someone's interested in knowing um, this is a wasted votes question. So how many of the voters in 2020 Dem primaries chose a candidate who later dropped out? So this kind of wasted vote problem. Sure, um, I could jump in on that one. Um, Fair Vote has been tracking these votes for withdrawn candidates, and there are sort of two parts to that. Um, the really egregious one is votes cast for a candidate who has already dropped out. We saw that a lot in some of the places that did vote by mail, but not ranked choice voting. So, you know, people had to put their ballots in the mail, uh, you know, or before election day. And then we had candidates dropping out in some cases only two or three days before the before the election, like around Super Tuesday. And so we ended up with um, over two million votes cast for candidates who had already withdrawn. Um, but the 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 question, as it was worded, I think asked um, how many voters chose a candidate who later dropped out. And well, we were tracking that too. Um, almost 5 million votes were cast uh, for candidates who would drop out later, but had not yet at the time the vote was cast. Um, and that does not count Bernie Sanders. Um, you know, Sanders was sort of the last opponent standing against, against Joe Biden. And so we have not been calling those wasted votes for a withdrawn candidate as he was the, the person who lasted the longest. So that my, my sum there was 2 million and 5 million for a total of 7 million Democratic votes. Thanks, that is a lot. Um, Scott, um, I'm gonna combine a couple of these questions for you to answer next. Uh, one is um, folks are interested in this kind of party run uh, primary about you know, who pays for that. Um, Deb mentioned they were kind of expensive. Uh, and the other is about uh, DNC rules. So other kind of, you know, another party question about, you know, could the DNC just pass a rule um, that uh, it wouldn't accept any delegates from a state if the delegate was not chosen through a ranked choice voting process? Good question. So uh, the first one, uh, costs associated with the party run primary. Uh, the short answer of the party run primary uh, is run by the party. So the party uh, picks up the costs. Um, the, uh, the, so that's like a downside uh, of this a little bit, um, uh, somewhat. And what we saw in Iowa was, you know, the Iowa Democratic Party 
usually gets a lot of, uh, you know, can fundraise and gets a lot of money to be able to run the caucuses or the first caucus in the state. There's a lot of uh, folks who want to give to the Iowa Democratic Party to help run their caucuses. But as you saw this year, um, they used some of that money to do a app system that broke down. Um, so when you're when you're not running your uh, election through you know the states, you're not using the state equipment, you're not doing all that stuff. So you're going to have to come up with other equipment, and that's going to have to be paid for. So the party picks up that cost, and then the party goes to whoever the party goes to donors or whoever else uh, to be able to to pick up the costs. Um, as far as the other question about DNC roles, so DNC, I, I imagine. Um, after this uh, presidential cycle, um, the DNC will have a lot of questions to answer about um, not just um, these kinds of rules, but should caucuses be done in, at all? Should we have no more caucuses? Uh, so Iowa, uh, obviously, was a caucus this year. Uh, Nevada, like we talked about, rolled their early voters uh, into the caucus system, uh, but uh, they had 75,000 people do the early voting, which was a ballot, and, and just 30,000 people doing their caucuses. Uh, and most other caucuses, either uh, from 2016, moved to uh, either state-run primaries or these party-run uh, uh, RCV elections. Um, so DNC can pass different rules uh, to do that, uh, but um, it's only as good as it, it needs to be um, you know, like somebody said in the chat, the, these states need to uh, themselves uh, pass the rules to do it. Uh, but the DNC does have some uh, role to play. The DNC approves all of the uh, uh, state delegate allocations, um, the state party plans. So Iowa, uh, Nevada, all these, uh, Alaska, Wyoming, Kansas, all these states uh, that used uh, ranked choice voting this year had to get it approved by the DNC. And um, so we've been working with folks at the DNC to get to get them on board to approve that. Um, so there are certain things that they can do, uh, but they are limited uh, in, in other aspects. Okay, thanks. Um, the next one is for you, Deb, um, and we have a lot of questions here. Uh, so we're going to um, try to get through as many as we can uh, before the top of the hour and then um, possibly stay over a little bit uh, late uh, for some of them as well. Uh, and then for um, other substantive questions, um, we will um, try to follow up and compile some of those uh, for you all. Um, later after this is over. So um, Deb, someone is interested in, would it be possible to just pass a simple bill that an election cannot be won without a majority? And so that would, you know, open up the field for different solutions um, like RCV. Sure. Uh, if it would be possible to pass a bill like that, although I argue that it might not be um, politically feasible, even if it's uh, legal. Um, if you you've passed something like that, then immediately your your state would not have a solution for your elections uh, unless you happen to be in the state of Maine, which already has ranked choice. Um, so I would argue that you you would need you know if we make plurality voting illegal in your state, you would need something there um, to to take that place. So maybe legally possible, but I, I don't see that as as getting very far. Yeah, and we do see in um, plenty of places sort of similar similar laws and, and often the outcome are uh, runoff uh, elections to try to get at that majority outcome. But of course, runoff elections are expensive. Um, in most of the cases, it's double the cost <laughs> of the election to have that, that extra um, election. So, okay, so thank you. Um, so here's a question um, for either Deb or Scott about um, RCV and vote by mail uh, in, in the primary, for primary states. Can we kind of tease out the impact of, of RCV and vote by mail in these primaries? Um, or can you kind of talk a little bit about what you think is going on there? Uh, I, could, I could jump in. Um, can mm -hmm. we tease out the impact of RCV versus vote by mail? Um, for the presidential races, unfortunately, no. Um, the 
pandemic put us in a situation where all of them used RCV and vote by mail. Um, we can uh, look at non-presidential races in jurisdictions that use more voting by mail. Um, a good example is San Francisco. Um, they have a prominent vote by mail program. Um, I believe I was told that more than half of San Francisco voters generally send, send in their election, send in their ballots by mail instead of in person. Uh, and so we see San Francisco has had ranked choice voting um, for over 10 years now. And in that city, we do see uh, strong turnout and low error rates. So we could um, we can talk more, I think, offline one on one if you want a deeper dive into really isolating isolating uh, vote by mail versus ranked choice voting. Unfortunately, we don't have the answer for presidential primaries. Yeah, I would I would I agree with that. The only thing I would add to it is um, we saw uh, a lot of states that do have uh, vote by mail and don't have ranked choice voting um, tend to have higher, you know, in, in turnout increases, uh, like Colorado and, and, and state of Washington and Oregon have a lot of vote by mail, and they tend to have higher turnout than other states. Uh, so that's great. But uh, this year, uh, vote by mail was used in the state of Washington uh, for the presidential primary. Uh, and there were quite a few voters there who voted uh, vote by mail, uh, which was great, but also they voted for uh, candidates who had dropped out. Um, so um, I think these two, uh, vote by mail and ranked choice voting, um, two, two uh, solutions tied together is, is kind of the best solution rather than one or, or just the other. Okay, thanks. Um, we also, we had a question about uh, whether RCV um, could be used to vote cross party um, in, in like open uh, primary elections. And, um, you know, basically it, the answer is uh, sure, it's up to the state parties to decide, um, you know, how those go uh, and RCV um, could, could actually absolutely be used in, um, open primaries and, and we talk a lot about that um, you know, solution um, in other contexts and of course um, within party primaries as well. Um, we also uh, had a question about tabulation that I think a couple folks at least were interested in um, for um, tabulating ranked choice voting elections. Um, so, you know, whether or not it needs to be centralized and, and if it does, does that make things more difficult? Um, so I'll throw that, that question out here um, to, to our panel here and I'm, I'm happy to jump in um, as well. Uh, I can quickly say a couple words on that. Um, so uh, for the, um, for the party, for the, uh, uh, three states so far, the four states that are using ranked choice voting for the presidential primaries, they have uh, uh, done centralization, um, but that's not necessary. So um, I would just say uh, one of the things that's really interesting as well is uh, Wyoming and Alaska and Kansas uh, for their uh, presidential primary elections, not only did ranked choice voting, not only did vote by mail, but all of them did a risk limiting audit of their election. Um, so that's important to, to, to know uh, because um, you know, there's a paper trail uh, and the risk limiting audit shows what exactly uh, actually happened. Um, so it, it's best practices to be able to do that. Uh, you can uh, main did centralization, uh, but the original concept that we had in Alaska wouldn't have done centralization. So it kind of depends on um, the state depends on the jurisdiction uh, of how it would be uh, used, uh, but it's not necessary that you do uh, centralization. Um, there are other ways, other means of combining the data uh, to be able to get to a to a statewide or congressional or what have you um, tally. Cool. Well, we um, are at the top of the hour right now, uh, so I just wanted to quickly let folks know um, we have a slide up on the screen about how you can get more involved. You can go to fairvote.org or you can text RCV to 52886 to get access to 
um, some uh, several options for how you can get involved in this work. Um, so I, it is at the top of the hour here, so I think we can sort of officially close um, the event, um, but if Deb and Scott are willing, we may stay on uh, for a few extra minutes uh, for um, some additional questions that we have coming in um, for folks that who really want to stay on late um, for folks on the East Coast. It's, it's very late, but um, we'll stick around for a little bit for those who are interested. So thank you again, everyone for participating and please um, continue to help us out with the Ranked Choice Voting Week of Action. Uh, you can get more details about that on our website, fairvote.org. Um, so um, there are some other questions here. Um, Deb, I think you flagged um, a couple. Um, one is about um, in California about getting rid of the top two uh, candidates open primary act. Can you talk about that one? Sure. Uh, so in California, they do the top two primaries, meaning uh, candidates from various parties all run together in a primary, and then the top two of those advance to the general election, which means you could have a general election with two candidates of the same party or two candidates of a different party. And the question is, would you need to get rid of that uh, in order to implement ranked choice voting? And no, these would be, these would be possible to go together. Um, I would point you towards what Alaska is working on and, and what some other places are doing. They're doing a top four plus ranked choice voting. Um, I believe that uh, Scott mentioned this earlier in the presentation tonight. So it means that in their uh, nonpartisan primary, the top four winners advance to a general election. And then that general election is done with ranked choice voting to you know, eliminate the vote splitting and the spoiler effect, et cetera. Um, so these different methods can definitely work together if that's something that your state or your jurisdiction has an appetite for. Cool, thanks. Um, Scott, can you talk about um, this uh, argument that you know RCV is better for one party or another? Um, that you know it's it favors a particular party over another. Sure. So uh, so what we what we really see is you know uh, ranked choice voting is a nonpartisan. Um, uh, you know, it does not favor Republicans, it doesn't favor Democrats, what it does favor is the voters. And what we've seen already, you know, Republicans in Utah passed a local options bill a couple of years ago. And now this year, Republicans in Utah used uh, ranked choice voting uh, for their internal uh, party presidential or party primaries or party uh, conventions. The Indiana uh, GOP is gonna use ranked choice voting for their um, party conventions. There's a lot of folks that um, you know believe um, you know ranked choice voting could 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 help them whether they're left, right, or center. Uh, but really, it's it, it's not a it's not a partisan change. It is a uh, reaching out to the voters change. So, um, for example, um, I will just give a quick um, uh, a quick story. Um, so, Maine used ranked choice voting in in uh, in 2018 uh, for their uh, uh, primaries and congressional federal elections. Um, I went up to Maine uh, early in 2018 to do a candidate training uh, with folks, uh, both Republicans and Democrats, on how to run a ranked choice voting election. Um, so you can run in a ranked choice voting election and, and uh, decide not to do any of the things that we we tell you to do or that would be good and then you're then um, you may end up losing and that's kind of what happened to Bruce Poliquin uh, where um, Jared Golden ended up winning in his race in the second congressional district uh, with the ranked choice voting election where they had four candidates in the race the Democrat Jared Golden the Republican Bruce Poliquin and two independents and um, for the first round, uh, Poliquin had a, a very few, but he did have uh, a few more votes than uh, the Democrat, uh, Jared Golden, uh, but, the, but he didn't have 50%. And um, the two independent candidates uh, were then eliminated and their votes uh, got Jared Golden uh, over the edge. Uh, and since then, Gold, uh, uh, Poliquin has 
kind of uh, been anti-RCV crusading out here and, and blaming RCV for his, for his, his uh, failure to, to win that uh, re-election. Uh, but he didn't reach out to independents. He didn't reach out and to his to the 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 second and third choices to try to get second and third choices from those independents. He ran an election like he always run he's always ran uh, with just uh, Republicans. And if he would have uh, ran to uh, bring in uh, those independents, I'm sure he would have won. Um, and uh, it it's it's just uh, uh, no way to really tell. Uh, whether um, a Democrat will win or a Republican would win in any kind of election. Uh, but ranked choice voting not just changes the math in a ranked choice voting election, it changes how the election is run at all. Um, so uh, Paula Quinn could have easily won in a ranked choice voting election if he would have uh, decided to do a little bit more grassroots outreach. And that's something I didn't really touch on before, but we, what we've seen previously in ranked choice voting elections in Minneapolis and St. Paul, in the Bay Area, Oakland and, and, and San Francisco, is it does favor candidates who have a good ground game, have a have a, a really like understand the voters, try to build coalitions. Um, so they knock on some, you knock on somebody's door and say, hey, um, do you support my candidate? And they say no, with the ranked choice voting election, you say, oh, you're voting for somebody else? I understand, I, I like that person as well. My candidate is like that person in these ways. Can I have, uh, can we count on you for a second choice vote? And in that way, you're broadening your support, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or Green or a Libertarian or what whatnot, it's really uh, there for the voters. At, so it can be used uh, by any of the, the, the uh, political parties in, in any way, but it's really, uh, it doesn't advantage one party or the other, it just advantages the voters. Well said, thank you. Um, so uh, this one is for you, Deb. You did spend a, a chunk of time on um, the Electoral College and um, national, the National Popular Vote um, Compact, um, but just a, a very direct question. In order for RCV to be most effective, is abolishing the Electoral College necessary? No, not at all. Um, RCV can work within the Electoral College uh, or it can work with a national popular vote. Uh, we went, we spent that time talking about uh, what would happen if we went to a national popular vote, just because we get that question a lot. Um, but right now, already, some states are using ranked choice voting within the context of the Electoral College. Um, Maine was the first state to do that. Uh, and so this November, in the 2020 election, for the first time, they will be allocating their electors using ranked choice voting. So it totally works with the Electoral College. Cool. Um, well, uh, we, all, we have a, a bunch of other questions here um, and uh, we, we can follow up uh, more with some of those soon. Um, but one uh, final one, um, at least that I'll throw out there and then you two can kind of jump in if you see others in the chat box. Um, but someone is, is interested in whether or not we can get uh, rid of primaries altogether uh, and have legislators set Legislature, legislators set the minimum requirements for the ballot and just vote once in November. Sure, uh, that would be possible. Um, you know, in, in a lot of states, the political parties like to have their own primary uh, to choose their own nominee. Uh, and so something like that is definitely possible at the state level, um, but you would be deliberately circumventing the party's option to choose their nominee themselves. Um, so that's where you might get pushback from if you actually tried to implement something like that. Um, but at the municipal level, like when cities or towns implement this, we absolutely recommend that they get rid of any preliminary election. Like a lot of cities have a preliminary um, that is nonpartisan before the general election. And we definitely recommend using ranked choice voting to eliminate that first round. Uh, so you can just have a nice high turnout representative electorate show up for one general election. Saves the city money and it's better for voters. Cool. Um, 
Well, we are well past time. Uh, so um, unless um, Scott or Deb wants to, to jump in, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up um, here. Scott, Deb? No, I think we're good. I think there's a lot of questions there and we'll, we'll take a look at those um, uh, as well after this and see if we can uh, make sure we um, follow up with you guys individually or, or as a group. Uh, like, like Katie said, uh, keep checking uh, the uh, Get Involved page right there in the week of action um, so we can uh, reach out to you. A couple of our organizers are, are here, um, uh, Diane and Nadia. Um, they can, can reach out to you guys uh, to answer any, hopefully any other follow-up questions, whether it's about, you know, I don't want to go, um, we, we don't have to go into the weeds about non-monotonicity or all these other um, uh, very in the weeds questions that I love, uh, but we can, we can, we can decide to, to talk about those in a, in a different forum. Um, but um, I appreciate everyone's um, engagement and, 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 and being able to ask a bunch of questions. One of my absolute favorite things about doing this webinar tonight was seeing you all in the chat, answering each other's questions and engaging and connecting with people from your own states. So thank you all for engaging so much with us and with each other tonight. Thank you, everyone. Um, please uh, get in touch uh, with us at, at fairvote.org uh, to get more involved. And again, stay with us uh, the rest of this week of action um, at fairvote.org.